my name is Hannah Jane Pritchett, current U of A GIST master's student. Welcome to the University of Arizona GIST podcast. Our hosts are Jennifer Mason and Yoga Korgauker. Today, we will be talking with Joshua Stevens, the lead visualizer of the NASA Earth Observatory. Let's get started. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the University of Arizona GIST podcast series. I am Jenny Mason, an assistant professor of practice here in the GIST program, and we have Yoga Korgauker, can you wait? Yeah. <laughs> who is also an assistant professor of practice in the program, and we are happy to welcome Joshua Stevens. He is the lead for data visualization and cartography at NASA's Earth Observatory. Thank you for joining us today, Joshua. Uh, yeah, of course. And um, I think we'll just get right into it because I know that you prepared a short presentation and then we can ask some questions after. But uh, if you could just share your screen. Sure. And actually, at the very beginning, if you could tell us what a lead for data visualization and cartography actually entails or what that means, that'd be great as a segue into what you're going to talk about. Sure, so basically I create visuals for NASA's Earth Observatory and I help oversee the visuals that others create and the overall style guide for our visuals as we share NASA data and other findings with the public. So I've put together a little slideshow to, to basically share about my background and what the Earth Observatory does. And is that coming through okay? Okay, perfect. So I started out studying GI science and geography at Michigan State University, though it didn't uh, wind up there so straightforwardly. I started out studying graphic design and computer science and sort of bouncing between the two, a little bit dissatisfied with both of them until it was like my junior year, actually, that I discovered cartography and GIS. So it was pretty much a late transition for me, but I, I fell in love right away. And from there, I did a master's at Michigan State and then finished that up and then went to Penn State to study more geography and cartography and, and focus a bit more on geo visualization. Um, after that, I, I joined NASA's Earth Observatory as their lead visualizer. And what the Earth Observatory is, is basically a daily publication of visuals and reporting from NASA missions. So this could be anything that's, you know, NASA puts in space to collect data or research that NASA has funded that's coming out from various researchers across the globe. And what, what's shown here is just like a typical article that the Earth Observatory might put out with a couple of visuals from NASA data. And then there's always reporting in text that explains what you're looking at, what data went into it, and, and what this means in, in the big picture sense of things. And there's sort of a, you know the boilerplate mission statement here that basically just explains that the, the, the mission is to share the stories, discoveries about the environment, Earth systems, and climate that emerge from NASA research, including the satellite mission, missions and in the field research and models. And that's one of the things that uh, a lot of people don't realize is that NASA, you know, obviously builds spacecraft and has satellites in space, but there are researchers who are checking ice cores or going out on research vessels, and they're, they're doing things from both the ground and in space and everything in between. And the Earth Observatory has been up since 1999, well before I joined. And since then, they've put out 15,000 stories, um, you know, in this way with visuals and reporting. And what's really neat is that over, the, over time, that these stories that have come out are increasingly data-driven. So data and analysis have played a, a really strong role in the things that we're putting out, and that's ramped up big time. What started out as sort of the image of the day has now become the images of the day as each article includes two, three, or even more images along with it. And one of my favorite aspects about this is that the visuals that we're including are increasingly map only. So what sort of started out as natural color imagery from satellites that basically look like photographs from space we're now including thematic maps and reference maps, animations and things like that that are very much more into the realm of GI science and, and a little bit um, bridging the gap between remote sensing and GI science. And some key points about this is that we're doing journalism, not 
PR for the agency. So we're, we're trying to report on real events that are happening around the world, disasters. We're not sort of, um, you know, advertising a certain mission just for the sake of it. We're, we're showing people things that are actually affecting their daily lives and things like that. And we always pitch our own stories among our team. So if we see something, you know, that's happened, whether, um, you know, something recently local to us, like for instance, right now, the Great Lakes are almost boiling with how warm they are. So that's a story that I pitched living here in Michigan, and that'll be coming out from us pretty soon using NASA data to look at the temperature of the lakes. And again, one of our, you know, this is just a typical view of an article, and this is one of my uh, favorites in recent years, where we used the Beers um, nighttime imagery to show Hurricane Matthew coming over to Florida and how the lights basically went out as power was cut for those people who, who lived along that path. And then we also scraped data from the power companies to show how that actually affected each county. So connecting something that the satellite is seeing with how it's affecting people on the ground is a theme that we really like to hit as often as possible. One of our more recent stories, obviously with everything that's happening with coronavirus, has been using satellite data to show the impacts of the lockdowns that happened um, immediately after things were noticed in Wuhan and the China initiated several lockdowns, we saw um, a big drop in nitrous dioxide in, in the atmosphere. And we could see that with satellites and that was one of our more popular stories in recent times. Oops. We also um, showed night lights of the same area. So this is around the Jianghan district where the, the market where supposedly the, uh, the virus broke out. And once things were noticed, the activity around that area decreased substantially. And that can be seen in differences in nighttime lighting. One of the key things that we try to do at the Earth Observatory is make everything that we produce reusable by others. So we always share large images that are clean without annotations. So other groups can put their own labels on things and use them. And news agencies in particular like to use our images to show things that, that happen. Um, one of our stories got picked up a lot from various groups looking at um, climate change in national parks, showing that spring is arriving early, earlier. So the same graphic that we produce might show up in multiple different venues as they do their own reporting using our imagery. Our imagery and uh, products were also picked up by the, the new Google Earth platform, which shows these sort of Voyager uh, experiences that guide users through Google, Google Earth using imagery and locations. So, so they set up a few of these based on uh, themes of imagery that we have put out. The Audubon Society is another one who frequently uses our imagery, and this time they used some night lights imagery of the United States, and they were doing a uh, basically a, a focus looking at how birds and light pollution and things like that relate and how that's affecting some bird species that migrate. This was really cool to see recently when uh, Sir Richard Branson at World o Branson at uh, World Ocean Day used some of our imagery in a slideshow as he, as he was speaking to the audience. There's basically a slideshow of you know dozens of images taken from the Earth Observ Earth Observatory, um, you know, playing so so the audience could you know check that out as he was speaking about that topic. Uh, a couple of years ago, it, I think it was on a Friday at like 4:30 in the afternoon, we got an email from Senator Wyden's office wanting to know if we could gather images of space showing the, the wildfires that were breaking out in Pacific Northwest. And, you know, despite just minutes to basically work on this, we, we got busy, pulled the data together and then sent his office those images. And the next day he was using them in, in a hearing. And, and that's another kind of thing that we like to do. We like to support, you know, other agencies and groups who might request information or imagery on a specific topic that's relevant at a time and then provide them with that if we're able to. Sometimes our imagery winds up in unexpected places, like we had our black marble imagery on the Colbert Report and some ice imagery used in the intro to ice road truckers. Which brings me to uh, just a couple remaining slides here to share some of the favorite projects that I've done over the recent years. Um, this is probably my all-time favorite here, and this is a black marble composite that we generated 
using an entire year's worth of nighttime imagery. And this particular composite is also overlaid with the Blue Marble product that NASA put out back in 2005 using the MODIS instrument, which shows a daytime view from space. So as the, the glow is sort of rotating here, you get a little peak of daylight on the side there, and that's showing the, the MODIS data as it comes through in the daytime. And then we have clouds layered also detected from NASA satellites. And this is just a, an equirectangular view of that same data. And we did this for 2012 and also 2016. So it's possible to, you know, sort of toggle between the two to see changes that occurred in those four years. Um, we've also produced difference maps that will show that change in a single, uh, single go. So in this instance, increases in nighttime lighting are purple and decreases are orange. This is also a moderately high resolution data set, so you can zoom in pretty closely. And in this instance, it's showing that same increase and decrease in nighttime lighting. And even though the, the work we did in this case was looking at two snapshots at 2012 and 2016, those measurements are done at a really fine scale. So we can see daily changes in nighttime lighting and track the radiance that, that's basically happening over time. In this case, the, uh, the graph is showing the, the changes that developed as the I-90 corridor in Illinois was being built. And suddenly once that new highway came online and the lights that went along with it, that area became much brighter. We also got a lot of press recently for showing aerosols across the globe. So this is a, a model from the GS5 uh, model. And basically it's showing carbon from fires in red, dust aerosols in purple, and sea salt across the ocean in, the, in blues. And this was really neat just to you know, look at this data and see all these things interacting. And this is a really interesting data set to work with because it's acquiring each of these variables at three, three hour intervals. So you can you know, look at these things almost like a movie and play them and see all these things interacting really dynamically. It's super awesome. Another cool thing is pairing natural color imagery with more, um, more abstract data visualizations from satellites. So in this case, there was a lot of conflict happening in Iraq near Mosul, and a sulfur plant had been set on fire at the same time as an oil field. And because those are two different elements that are burning, the smoke that they produce is very different. And it's really neat to be able to see that, you know, in, in imagery that essentially looks like a photograph. You know, as unfortunate as the events are, it provided a good opportunity to contrast the science that's happening and the air as these things burn. So we could also measure these and measure the sulfur dioxide from satellite and show how that, you know, actually does affect an area outside of, you know, a rock. And it becomes a bigger issue, you know, as things go, come into the atmosphere that what we do on the ground isn't just, it doesn't stay there in terms of aerosols and things. Another one of my favorites was looking at the eruption of Kilauea that recently happened. And that event got a lot of news because people were starting to wonder, you know, with all this sulfur dioxide happening, is it going to affect climate? You know, is it actually going high enough in the atmosphere? And all the scientists, you know, thought that was a crazy question because of course it's not. So we wanted to really uh, make that clear with an illustration to show the height of the sulfur dioxide plume and, and basically show that it's not even reaching the height of the volcanoes there. So it's just, you know, leaching out of the ground and staying really low and even decreasing uh, quite a bit as it traveled on. And this was a graphic that we did entirely in open source software. So this was done using QGIS and a JavaScript library called 3JS. In terms of open source software, this is one of my favorite projects that really turned me on to the idea of automation and using code to produce things. This is showing sea surface temperature anomalies and anomalies at depth, which shows the oncoming of an El Nino, how the El Nino dies out, and then some Kelvin waves sort of rippling across the surface. And this is a kind of um, a visualization that would simply be impossible to make in traditional GIS software. So coding and, and being able to automate things played a big role in producing this sort of visualization. We also occasionally make more reference style maps. We can do some um, 
sort of wayfinding with topography and terrain. So this is one we made for a story about the channeled scatlands in Washington. And we do some of these uh, beauty shots also using NASA data. This is a Landsat scene draped over SRTM digital terrain model and rendered in Blender, which is again, another open source software. So the, the sort of theme that's uh, developing here is that just about all of these visualizations are made in open source software and through a variety of you know, point and click GUIs as well as coding and automation. Another one of our uh, typical visualizations during hurricane season is that we like to show that the sea surface temperature plays a big role in the strength of a storm and where storms go. Because the warmer that water is, the more power the storms can have. So this was Hurricane Lane um, over Hawaii in 2018. And speaking of hurricanes, one of the sort of more fun things that we did looking at Hurricane Maria was to generate a 3D model of it. A lot of times we showed the thermal signature of the cloud tops, but the, the, the temperature of the clouds is related to how high these clouds are. So there's inherently a 3D structure in that kind of measurement. So we turned that to a 3D model. And this turned out to be one of my favorite interactions because someone emailed us and said, hey, do you have that model? I would like it, and we sent the data to him, and he actually 3D printed it out in his lab, which was really neat to see that you know come to life just from an image of the day that he had read on the Earth Observatory. This is another example of sort of a, a train map, but this one also includes a beam from ISAT-2, which fires billions of photons down at the ground sort of as it's orbiting by, and from that, um, scientists can measure elevation really precisely at the centimeter level. So you can see that there's differences in tree cover and shrubland as it's measuring the height of the overall surface. We do get into, you know, animations and videos a bit. And uh, this is an animation that was showing rainfall over a, a flooding event in India and Burma. And this again is another thing, you could probably do it in a GUI with a bit of time but coding this sort of thing and having an automated process to do this all in code turns something that you know, might take hours into something that usually takes minutes. And that's really important for a group like ours who are focused on the journalism aspects of this. As events happen, we need to be able to create visuals very quickly so that we can be, begin reporting on them and then get them out to the public you know, very quickly. If we wait too long, then the event has passed and that information becomes less relevant. And I believe this is the last example, and this is probably one of the more fun ones I've encountered over my five years at NASA. And this was using satellites to identif identify penguin colonies. And this is just a normal satellite view of these uh, islands in the Danger Island area of Antarctica. And with our naked eye, it doesn't look that, that interesting, unless you're someone who knew a little bit about penguins. And they would immediately see that the sort of pink hues on these islands might indicate penguin guano, which happens to sort of be pink. And it turns out we can use satellite to actually detect that. So essentially, you know, by looking at these images and detecting the penguin poop from space, scientists were able to use this to identify new colonies of penguins in Antarctica and, and islands that have typically been uh, too hard or, or expensive to visit and actually take these measurements from the ground. So that's basically that presentation, that little spiel. So I'd be happy to you know, talk about anything else or answer any other questions that you might have. I have a question. That was fascinating to see kind of how you merge both the analysis and GI science, remote sensing with the visual side to communicate it. And I'm curious, uh, you know, I know you obviously have a team that's releasing these images and a science writer working on this for every map or um, article every day. How do you guys, you know, from the start, choose an article or a topic? Obviously, I'm sure this changes depending on what you're releasing. And then, you know, what's the process from start to finish for creating your maps? And maybe, you know, for the students or people who are interested too, you could touch on some of the commonly used software or tools that you might use to create this. Sure, and you're exactly right. It definitely changes with the, the topic and the, the story that's happening. 
A lot of times we'll just browse through natural color imagery to see what's interesting along the, you know, happening in the world. And we'll say, okay, there's, you know, some neat vortexes in these clouds. We'll write a story about that. Other times we see a new paper come out in a journal about something really interesting using NASA data. So we'll pitch that and we'll start getting in contact with the author to, you know, see if that data is available to replicate their analysis and so on. And a lot of times we just get emails from people, whether they're scientists or just the general public saying, Hey, this is really cool. Have you ever looked at this thing? Or I might have some data that shows this and we'll, we'll take a look at that. Um, there was one case, somebody sent some photos that they took. I, th I believe they're flying into Kuwait and they saw this neat landscape from the airplane. And we ended up writing a story about that and then showing a 3D model of that geology, you know, from the same kind of vantage point of where their airplane might have been. And we, we like I said, we certainly use a lot of open source software. Um, QGIS is used often among my team. And, and basically what happens is, we'll, whether it's the imagery or data that we get, we'll start putting that data together very early on, whether it's me or another visualizer on my team. And we have basically a wiki where we post everything and that immediately starts getting reviewed, you know, for like style, accuracy and things like that. But it also gives the writer um, a, ba a basis to work from for the reporting. They might send that to scientists for further review and, and commentary or start looking at other data sets. Once we can see something in one data, maybe that's indicative of what we might see in another data set. And one follow-up question um, before Yoga asks, uh, do you have templates that you like reuse or, you know, I would imagine because you have so many maps and charts and graphics um, that you like have stored somewhere that you pull on for these? Yeah, absolutely. We have a collection of color palettes that we use for certain phenomena. So we're, you know, if we show rainfall, it's got a certain palette. If we show land surface temperature as a certain palette, there's a collection of code routines for certain data that will process it and put it into the formats that we can use. There are QGIS project files that we use for certain types of data. And then there's also more, more straightforward templates in Photoshop and, and things like that for each graphic that we have that puts the palette in a certain place. And we also have a few scripts for like calculating a scale bar and then automatically putting that on the image using Photoshop so that we have a very consistent look and feel for that placement as well. Uh, I have two questions just about what you've talked so far. The first one is uh, you talk about scripting. So are there any particular languages you go to or do you code in a bunch of different languages and bring them all together? And my second question was uh, these, some of these projects sound very big. So, and I know that NASA releases images every day. So how do the deadlines or the time duration work for these projects? If you can talk about that a little bit. Sure. So in particular, I use Python a lot. I mean, that, that's just really helpful no matter if you use ArcGIS or QGIS. Python is really helpful to know. And then I rely on Bash a lot to script things and, and run commands with GDAL. So that, that can be easily called from Bash just to you know, automate and loop through things. And then the, the deadline issue is, is definitely a big one for us. Since we publish every single day, deadlines are constantly looming. So we're always trying to work ahead. So we'll have you know, one thing done today to buy us time to work on one of the larger projects. And some of the things like the uh, black marble imagery that I showed, that took several months with several collaborators and our team who actually did the, you know, the real data pulling, pulling all the data together and all the analysis and then it gets passed over to us for other, other parts of the work. So depending on how big the project gets, it might spill over to other teams within NASA who can sort of help us hit a deadline that might be three months out while we're sort of chipping away on the, the daily routines. I'm curious, uh, you know, as a cartographer or visualizer, how you kind of continually get inspired because there's always new graphics coming out, new types of maps. You know, are there blogs that you frequent or go on Twitter um, to help you get inspired for, you know, fun new ways to visualize charts and whatever maps? Yeah, absolutely. Like Twitter is so helpful for that. Not only in seeing, you know, new types of maps that people are developing in the news that's, you know, happening the way people are representing certain things, but also in, in the explosion of people who are sort of creating really stunning and inspiring maps. Like that's been the number one resource for me to just to follow and learn and, and connect with new people in the field. And then speaking of sources, 
while you were preparing for what you are right now, were there any particular sources that really helped you pick up skills and tools that you would recommend to students who are trying to do the same now? It was sort of a mix between, you know, classical training and, and the, the programs that I went to and the, the cartography courses that taught me the basics about color theory and, and good design skills, but then just sort of applying things and trying to do things that the classes weren't showing or, you know, maybe seeing something really cool on the internet and trying to recreate that. And, and a little bit of self-teaching helped play a role in, in that as, as well. A follow-up on that, are there specific skills um... I've been asking like in every podcast, either hard skills such as programming or soft skills. Uh, I always mention like critical thinking or being able to figure out things on your own um, that you find essential for your type of job um, and doing your daily tasks. Yeah, I mean, the programming thing is really big. And I would say one of the things that I actually wish I would have learned more in programs, which I think I don't see too often in many programs, is teaching a bit more about scientific data formats and that things exist that aren't geotiffs and shape files. There are HDF files and netcdf files and being familiar with those can open so many doors with, you know, regardless if you want to be a scientist or work in the scientific domain, just being able to understand someone else's data and not be sort of bogged down by these things that you might eventually encounter in your, your job or your studies, whatever that may be. And as far as soft skills go, I think, you know, it's one of those things, too, is like just being able to pick up the phone and ask people questions. I think that gets sort of lost in our society today. It's very digital and everyone wants to email or things like that. But a lot gets lost in that translation. And I think if people just, you know, call one another and hear their voices and now, you know, even with Zoom, things can really speed along. and People see that, oh, this person's really trying to help me or they, they have this question or thought about something in a way that just with email doesn't communicate well. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, communication, especially now, face to face as well, or just talking sometimes is better than writing a long email. I'll agree with that. Um, I'll switch directions a little bit. Can you talk about the the work culture at NASA? I think everyone will be really excited or curious to know how that works. Yeah, it, it's a very diverse culture, and it's very. Um, I mean, you, you'll find all kinds of, you know, each team might have their own, their own sort of culture and how, how they're, they operate from, you know, very rigid, you know, scientific uh, driven to kind of laid back. I mean, there's people building neat models of hurricanes out of Legos and their job is to post those on social media. So, you know, everything from, you know, very serious and, and somber to laid back and, and uh, you know, just fun. My team happens to be one that is very open and, and engaging and we, we try to be fun. I mean, we, we do keep an eye on making sure we're right because everything that we say, even though we're not speaking for the agency ourselves, a reporter is gonna pick that up and say, NASA says so-and-so. So our work has to be very serious, but we try to have as much fun doing it as, as we can. And a follow-up on, on your team, um, can you talk about how many team members you have? What is their background? Are they all GIS people? Or are they from different backgrounds coming together, contributing in different ways? Sure. So our team, I, I believe there's about nine now on the editorial team. And it's really hard to, to quantify that because there's so many sub-teams and we interact so closely that it's hard to say, well, this person is definitely on this team and not this other team. But, but our core team consists of visualizers like myself. There's another visualizer who also specialized in geography. We have writers who um, focused on uh, scientific and technical writing. We have editors who come from magazine backgrounds and you know publishing and project management. There, there's not a, there's only really two of us that come from a very GI science focused background and everyone else either studied geology or writing or, you know, something that in some way relates to communication and earth science, but definitely not specifically GIS alone. Shifting gears again, um, I was thinking, you know, every time I teach cartography, it, there's always a few students whose minds are blown, you know, they, they just go with the default. They just click the buttons, a map's made, and when they sort of learn about different concepts and principles, um, for how to make you know better maps, they 
they are always amazed at how much thought can go into just creating a map. And I know, you know, looking at your website that you guys apply things like user center design, thinking about users, helping them read maps better. I saw a web page um, about even, you know, a large portion of the population being red, green, colorblind and making colorblind safe imagery. And I just wanted to hear more about the role that this kind of user centered design plays in your imagery and charts and, you know, how you guys stay up to date with that kind of research and apply it in your visualizations. Sure. So that, that does play a big role and it actually helps us a lot by leaning on and relying on the science that's out there with perception and, and design and, and following those guidelines generally produces a decent map. You know, if you, you're using line weights and font sizes that, that people can see and colors that are, are linear with the, the data that they're representing, it's gonna be a decent map almost all the time like if, you, if you follow good guides. But the, one of the, the harder parts probably is recognizing that cartography and visualization is inherently an artistic endeavor. So there's a, always that drive to be creative and, and do something and you know, push the boundaries. And deadlines and things like that, as, you know, as unfortunate as they, they can be sometimes, those kind of things actually help constrain and you know, give people space to have that creative room knowing that they can be a little bit creative, but still that deadline is going to prevent them from you know, just running wild with some idea. So a combination of good sound scientific practices, structured deadlines, templates, and things like that play a really strong role. And just also, I would say, you know, following trends, not so much that you just jump on board with the trend that's out there, but just being aware of it to see, okay, what, what, you know, what's the Washington Post doing? What is New York Times doing? What are these other groups doing? And why are they doing that? And that why question can help guide some of the decisions, you know, that you might make towards making a good map. A good example of that lately is a lot of maps from other groups aren't just text on images. They're like native text within the web page. So users can select that text on a map label, or if they have certain browser settings for larger font sizes, that's being taken, you know, account with the map design. So Previously, you mentioned doing something fun and then just now about creative stuff. So I have to ask you about Bigfoot <laughs> and what your role was in mapping Bigfoot uh, and uh, about your creativity in creating a map about Bigfoot and getting that data and what inspired you to do that. Yeah, so, you know, as funny as it might seem, Bigfoot was, uh, he played a big role in my career, not because, it, you know, anything directly related, but that map was created before I joined NASA when I was still, you know, a PhD student, and I was so focused on teaching classes and doing research and just the busy life of a PhD student that that sort of creative drive that I had was really stifled, and I needed something to do to just, to, you know, have fun with some data. And that's how I came across the Bigfoot data. And once I realized that that was actually just, you know, it's a totally goofy topic and it was fun to make, but people really responded to that map, you know, whether they've seen Bigfoot or they just thought it was a cool map or they hated it because Bigfoot's not real. And, and just seeing that, you know, you can create something, put it out there and people react to it. That was a big turning point for my career when I realized, you know, being an academic probably wasn't what I wanted to do. I mean, you know, there are academics out there looking at Bigfoot, but, you know, creating maps and informing people or just engaging with them through visual content and seeing that I could do that was a big turning point for me. I think I'll just add to that for those who feel like they're creatively bogged down, just find a good topic that you like and just make a map out of it and then share it with the world and see what happens. Absolutely. I think I'll, my last question is, just, you know, for all the people who are watching this, perhaps students or anyone interested in going into, you know, a GIS or visually driven career, you know, what advice or tips you might have, um, you know, or if you could go back, anything you might change for people starting out. Sure. And I would just, you know, bounce it back off that previous question and just, you know, use those skills to do something you love, whether it's Bigfoot or it's cars or anything, 
if you're passionate about something and you can apply what you're learning in the class to that, then that's not only going to help you learn that thing, but you're going to have a lot of fun doing it. And then that might get you a job somewhere, you know, whether it's at NASA or you know, some Bigfoot club, who knows? All right. Well, thank you, Joshua, for joining us today. That was a really fun talk and amazing visuals. Um, and we look forward to seeing your maps of the day throughout the rest of the year. Thanks. I appreciate it. And I'm, uh, I'm glad you brought Bigfoot into the mix. <laughs>